Okay, would like, I would like to start the afternoon session. So let, uh, can we start? The session right after the lunch is a bit tough one, but we would like to make the exciting economic session. So the, let's start the economic session. I'm Ipe Fujiwara, professor of macroeconomics uh, here at the ANU and the KO University. And uh, we are really fortunate to have a Dr. Yuri Okina, the chairperson of the Japan Research Institute, as the speaker of the economic session at the Japan Update 2018. Yuri is one of the most respected economists in Japan and has a deep knowledge of the various economic issues such as financial system, taxation, monetary and fiscal policy, social security, medical things, and even fintech, okay, namely every important field in macroeconomics. And uh, as a result, Yuri has been a member of the various government committee, such as the Financial Service Agency Council, on financial services and the government tax research specialist commission. So she has been doing so many important jobs. And uh, so therefore we have the perfect person for the speaker in the economic session to discuss economic challenges in Japan from various perspectives. We are also fortunate to have uh, uh, Mr. Jason McDonald, the chief advisor and the G20 Sous Shelpa, am I pronouncing correctly? Yeah, sous Shelpa. It's a Sous Shelpa, okay, sorry, it's a difficult word. So that, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, anyways, it's a really important job, okay? So then, uh, <laughs> Sous Shelpa, in the domestic policy group of the Department of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet are the discussant in this session. So that Jason is one of the most influential policy economists in Australia. I had uh, several chances with Jason to discuss the economic issue, and. Uh, He's always smart, and um, I tend to talk a lot and get lost, don't understand even what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, Jason can interpret what I say in the nicest and the most elaborated manner. So as a result, all I need to say is always, yeah, that's what I mean. So it's a, he's, a, <laughs> he's a really nice person. So, the, and, uh, so therefore, uh, to conclude, uh, we have the perfect speaker as well as a perfect discussion, discussion in this economic session. So without a further ado, so we would like, uh, please join me welcoming Okina-san. Fujiwara-san, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yuri Okina, and I'm an economist of the Japan Research Institute. So, today I'd like to uh, uh, make a presentation about Japan's economy and policy issues going forward. So, I, I'd like to uh, give you the brief sketch about the uh, Japanese economy uh, now, and uh, then I would like to explain how uh, we are evaluating the Abenomics after five years. So this is the process prospects of uh, Japan's economy. So Japan's economy is recovering moderately, and the annual rate of real GDP has been around one percentage. And this recovery will continue until next year. Uh, it's said to, uh, said to be uh, uh, continue until next year, the year before the Tokyo Olympic Games held in 2000. But there are various risks mainly from abroad, uh, such as the protectionist policy of the US and the emerging, uh, emerging market contingency risk and so on. And Economic recovery is supported by the relatively domestic demand and external demand. And uh, economic coincidence index has been rising, reflecting a pickup in production and shipments. Uh, these are the uh, growth trends of the exports. And the growth trend in exports of capital goods and so on is uh, just continues. And we are exposed to China or US or the US or Europe and so on has been increasing. So industrial production in Japan saw moderate increases from now, uh, 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 this, these days. But the US protectionist trade policies are now severe concern for Japan's economy. Concerns have spread to Japanese companies with factories in China uh, due to the trade war between the U.S. and China, 
and Japanese automobile co companies who with factories in Mexico or Canada due to revision of the agreement of NAFTA. So we are especially worried about uh, whether automobile tariff uh, for Japanese cars are realized or not. As the automobile industry covers broad range of the fields, there is a risk that if the tariff is realized, uh, this, it will result in downward pressure on production in Japan. So uh, this is a capital investment and uh, thanks to the relatively good environment, corporate <coughs> earnings have been remained uh, strong. So uh, as you can see, uh, the abundant, uh, reflecting abundant cash flow, capital investment has remained on a moderate upward trend. Uh, private investment are focused mainly in the fields of labor saving against the backdrop of labor shortage and the capacity building corresponding to the digital innovation. So as you can see that uh, uh, business, uh, rating indicators for business fi fixed in investment is increasing now. And This is an um, um, unemployment rate in Japan. As you can see, the um, employment rate stayed at very, very, very low level, about 2% percent point or so. And since the beginning of the, uh, 2018, the pace of increase in the number of workers, mainly non-regular workers, uh, has accelerated. So Japan is said to be recording in a state of a near full em employment, I think. So, <clears throat> and this is a slide of the household consumption. Uh, although wages for non-regular workers are increasing, wages for regular employees are, are, are sluggish. Increase of the wages of the regular employees are sluggish. But thanks to the improvement, uh, improved em employment, uh, you know, uh, as, as that I uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the unemployment rate is very low, uh, household consumption expenditure will remain on a moderate, moderate recovery path. But uh, the inflation subdued at below 1.0 percentage. So although Bank of Japan has resorted to monetary easing aggressively for five years, uh, for maybe uh, five years, and consumer prices, this bloodline uh, uh, increase has been very low, below 1.0 percent level. So uh, it's about 0.7 percentage or so. So uh, it is uh, one of the big issue in Japan. So <clears throat> let's move on to the evaluation of Abenomics. So <clears throat> five years, uh, almost six years have passed since the Abe administration came to power at the end of 2012. Let us first compare the major economic indicators for the fourth quarter of 2012 and the most recent figures for 2018. Overall, the economy is displaying steady growth. Uh, GDP is just from uh, uh, increasing and uh, GDP gap, it's a uh, supply and demand gap uh, is, has been largely eliminated and the unemployment rate uh, it is 4.3% 4, 4 to 2.2% 2, 2, 2 so significantly the unemployment rate has uh, reduced. But at the same time inflation rate is very low. Uh, this is uh, Yes, this, 
0 point, minus 0 point, 0 point 0.1 percent to 0 point 0.7 percent, and uh, you know the potential growth rate has barely risen, and the uh, ratio of outstanding debt to GDP has increased. It's a very huge amount, I think. So. This is a brief sketch of the comparison of the uh, start of Abenomics and now. And <clears throat> as may, maybe you know that the three arrows of Abenomics, but the three arrows of Abenomics were the policy package of the Abe administration. Uh, they were at the uh, old three arrows. Uh, uh, this is uh, 2013 uh, when the Abe administration started, he said that uh, the three arrows are very important. They were a bold monetary policy. Uh, it is a 2% inflation target. And quantitative and qualitative easing, QQE, uh, is a very important. And the two is a flexible uh, fiscal policy. Uh, it's a large scale public spending. And third is a growth strategy that stimulates private sector investment. Uh, measures including uh, regulatory reform, reform of corporate governance, and reduction of corporate taxes, and so on. In 2015, uh, Abe was elected as a leader of liberal, liberal democratic parties presidential election and position the next three years as the second stage of Abenomics. Abe announced the new three arrows for Abenomics, uh, taking up the slogan, a society in which all 100 million people can be active. The new uh, three arrows are a strong economy that produces hope and uh, support for child raising that fosters dreams and three, uh, the, uh, social security that provides students with a sense of reassurance. In concrete terms, uh, the policy continues to prioritize a growth strategy, but also seeks to hold the decline of the birth rate uh, and create a society that promotes women's involvement in the workforce, looking towards a situation in which no woman needs to be leave the workforce in order to provide nursing care uh, to a member of her family. So how do we evaluate abenomics? I think uh, it is very important to, I'd like to point out the three points. The former, the old three arrows were skewed towards monetary policy. And the growth strategy is producing outcomes but speed is lacking. And the third one is a, it's a very important uh, uh, point that the social security reform is essential. So I'd like to <coughs> uh, explain about uh, each point. So this is the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan. So <coughs> The former three allows of Abenomics commenced with the Bank of Japan's monetary policy. Haruhiko Kuroda announced that policy on his appointment as governor of the Bank of Japan in April 2013, and attempting the realization of a 2% inflation target in two years by the radical quantitative qualitative easing, QQE, including the annual purchase of Japanese government bonds totaling 50 trillion yen per year. As you can see from the chart, uh, the volume of the Bank of Japan's balance sheet is increasing rapidly since uh, 2013. Initially, the new monetary policy had not only decreased interest rates, but also produced a weaker end. This result promoted the purchase of Japanese stocks by overseas, mainly by the overseas investors, and uh, uh, boosting stock prices. We may say these positive, uh, 
effects improve the profitability of Japanese uh, companies, I think. But um, these are the, the trends of the long-term interest rates. So still Bank of Japan failed to boost the inflation rate. Bank of Japan had no choice but for a further monetary easing with the introduction of a negative short-term rate and yield curve control policy that picked the long-term interest rate to close to zero. Uh, please look to this yield curve control. The long-term rate is uh, uh, the, uh, almost a zero percentage. Uh, however, as I said, even after five years, the inflation rate has not reached 1%. And the variety of negative side effects have been generated. The low for wrong interest rates have dampened the profitability of banks, uh, especially for the uh, regional banks in Japan. And the uh, Bank of Japan's peak of long-term late interest rates, around 0%, led to a lack of market warnings as debt growth. And uh, this is a ratio of the Bank of Japan's asset to GDP. Uh, maybe you can say very, uh, you know, that compared with the FRB and the European Central Bank, the uh, <coughs> Bank of Japan's asset to GDP ratio is very, very large. Uh, so uh, considering Japan's worsening fiscal situation, an exit from quantitative qualitative easing uh, is increasing difficult prospect. So let's move on to the growth strategy. The <clears throat> major direction set forth in the growth strategy proposed by the new three arrows of economics, uh, work time reform, <coughs> flexible working styles, uh, fostering human resources, uh, like uh, university reforms and so on, and uh, reform of corporate governance, introduction of corporate governance code, and uh, support for the innovation in the digital arena, uh, essential initiatives, or I think it's, uh, these are the essential initiatives for Japan. And uh, Japan's <coughs> growth strategy now is just trying to realize the society 5.0. Uh, this, is a, this means an ultra smart uh, society using the Internet of Things or uh, big data or uh, AI or the, uh, and new technology. The world of society 5.0 was originated in Japan. <laughs> it was uh, originated in Council for Science and Technology Policy in Japan in 2016. And the government says that in the society 5.0 system, people's lives will become more comfortable and sustainable by the techno technological innovation. Uh, as you know that uh, uh, in Germany, uh, industry 4.0 is uh, just uh, mainly uh, focused uh, to the uh, manufacturing industries, but uh, society 5.0 uh, is just uh, focused to the you know, people's lives. So how, uh, it is important to the technological innovation improves the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, lives of the uh, life levels of the peoples, uh, especially for the elder people. Yeah, uh, maybe you think that what is the uh, society 1.0 and 1.2, 2.0 uh, or 3.0? This is a, a you know, hunter-gathering society, agriculture, uh, uh, you know, the society of agriculture and industrial society. And now we are the information society, society 4.0. And uh, we are going to uh, realize the society 5.0. And uh, as you can see from the red bar in the chart, uh, the productive age population has been shrinking uh, since uh, 2000 uh, and 2000, yeah. 
And uh, considering the uh, decline of the productive age population, the most, po most important policy issue for Japan is productivity, to increase the productivity, I think. So rapid implementation of supply side re reforms are urgently needed. So as indicated uh, before uh, by my slide, the potential growth rate figures uh, initiatives made by Abenomics have not yet led to an increase of the productivity so far. So <clears throat> these are the strat uh, growth strategy of, the, uh, of uh, 2017 and 2018. So <clears throat> a policy uh, uh, decision of to focus on five strategy field like health, health and long, sorry, health and longevity, longevity of the uh, people's, uh, 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 of the people, and the transportation revolution, and the fintech, and so on. So the policy of uh, promoting digital innovation in the field of such area uh, has been set out, but I think an, in, an increase in the higher speed of reform is essential against the background of intensifying international competition. So, <clears throat> with the outstanding debt to GDP ratio uh, standing at an extremely high level uh, compared with other countries, this is Japan and uh, the US and the, four, uh, the European countries are like this. So this is a very, very uh, high level. So, but uh, I think that uh, further advances in fiscal restriction will be inevitable, even with an increase in consumption tax scheduled for next year. And uh, this figure is, uh, shows the expenditure and tax revenue of Japan for about 45 years. It is often said in Japan the shape of this is like a, uh, uh, like a shape of the mouth of a crocodile. <laughs> and um, total expenditure uh, of the government remains very high level because of the increasing social security spending, like Medicare or aged people care and so on. And the tax revenue is a blue line and as you, you can see that uh, the very low level is, uh, in, uh, is continuing and now just a little bit increasing. And uh, this uh, increases is due to the uh, increase of corporate and income tax after the Abenomics and also the consumption tax hike in 2015. <coughs> but as I said, that the social security uh, expenditure is very high, and considering the demographic change, maybe Akiyama Sensei will uh, present uh, next session, but uh, let me see the, uh, the trend on in population composition by age group. But uh, uh, it is said that from 2005, uh, uh, Japan will become a super <coughs> aged society. Uh, let me, uh, Look to the red line, and this is the ratio of 75 and above population. So from the 2000 to 25, <coughs> this uh, ratio is increasing <coughs> dramatically. So uh, we, uh, I, we think that uh, we have to uh, prepare for the super aid society uh, as soon as possible, I think. And this is a change in the consumption of fiscal expenditure from 1960 to uh, 20, uh, 2018. And so I think that the, of particular importance is control increase in social security. This is, this position is, uh, uh, composition is very large in, nowadays. And uh, Social security related expenditure are 33 trillion yen and accounting for uh, the about 
if the, we omit the national debt service and so on, the accounting for 55% five, five, five of the general expenditure in 2018 budget. So in, increasing health, healthy life expan, expan, expectancy and boosting the efficiency of the medical, uh, uh, boosting the efficiencies of the uh, of the medical care provision through better coordination of medical data are priorities, I think. In addition, it will be essential to control medical and elderly nursing care related public expenditure in diverse areas while maintaining health insurance for all students. So it is very uh, difficult task for Japan, I think. So, as you can see uh, the, from the, this uh, left chart shows that the supply of the caregivers for the old people will run short. Uh, it's, a, it's a start of the super aged, uh, uh, super uh, old age uh, era. Uh, it's a 37, 7,000 people are uh, 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 projected to be lacking. And the uh, results of the surveys concerning social, social security shows that about 93 percentage point of respondents feel anxiety uh, uh, strongly or to some extent uh, to feel anxiety is represented 93 percentage regarding the future sustainability of the social security system. So I think eliminating the anxiety about the, fu about the future that Japanese citizens are experiencing and uh, will surely benefit uh, the growth of the Japanese economy and its society. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Okina-san. So now it seems like a very difficult to find a peak in, in the future in the Japanese <laughs> economy. But uh, so that we would like to have uh, the comments and the questions from Jason. So that, could you start? Uh, yes, thanks very much, uh, Ipe, for inviting me here. And it's a, it's a real privilege to be uh, at this event uh, with such distinguished economists around me. And I want to say thank you very much to Shiro as well. Uh, why, one of the reasons why it's such a privilege is uh, the Japanese economy uh, is so unique and so interesting that I think if you love economics, at some point uh, you'll spend a bit of time thinking about the Japanese economy. Uh, I studied it uh, at university in the, in the 90s, it's, it's history, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been with me as, a, as an interest ever since. Uh, and you do get a lot of the world's great economists looking at it. Uh, you know, Bernanke obviously has had a bit of interest and, and, and Krugman and, and, and others. Y Yuri's uh, presentation was uh, so comprehensive and so good when I asked some of my team to have a look and give me some comments that I could make, they came back and said they didn't have any criticisms. So what you're about to hear are, are, are my scattered thoughts. Um, one of the really interesting things uh, uh, in, in the presentation was the size of uh, Japan's debt. And this has been a big debate in economics for, for many years. Uh, exactly uh, how, how much debt can one country have? What, what is the limits of fiscal sustainability and what creates those limits? And it's particularly interesting at the current time when you see uh, countries which mu with much lower levels of debt much lower deficits and much younger populations mm -hmm. uh, suffering more because of their fiscal situation than Japan appears to be. Uh, and it seems to have something to do with the fact that uh, Japan's debt or in any country's uh, f uh, financial stability, fiscal su sustainability, is linked to whether their debt is issued in their own currency or a foreign currency. If it's issued in your own currency, then it's uh, much more stable and sustainable through time. Also, if you've got a high savings rate. And uh, the third one is a, a very sound financial sector. So those three things uh, are clearly uh, in Japan's favour when going to markets to, uh, to uh, ask people to finance their government deficit. Um, 
Some other things that are interesting about the Japanese economy is that when we think about its growth rate, uh, uh, we really have to think about uh, its, the size of the, the inputs that are going into it. So while we might think a 1% growth rate is quite low, it's not low given the size of the Japanese uh, working age population, the declining working age population. So in the sense of what its potential is, Japan's economy and its economic performance has been quite remarkable recently. Um, uh, there is obviously risks around net exports with such a, a, a country uh, so tuned into uh, the global trading system as Japan. Japan and net exports have been providing a, a boost uh, and not for obvious reasons that is a, a, a risk uh, going forward. Uh, another risk that's kind of more structural is potentially the uh, fact that modern supply chains, international trade is two thirds investment goods traded across borders. So the, the goods that are traveling across borders are those goods which are used in other, in other, uh, other business production in other countries. And where the global economy seems to be going with new technology is a, is a uh, reduction in the size of the capital needed to produce things. So a question I guess uh, I've got in my mind and have had for a while is, um, is, new, is the new technology going to improve the efficiency of capital uh, so much that a lot of these uh, transporter goods uh, uh, won't be needed? And you can actually see that in the trade data at the moment with services becoming uh, a larger share of uh, global trade. Uh, and one other, I've got a few more. Another interesting thing from the presentation is the, is the uh, Japanese labour market. Uh, the rapid uh, and uh, un, uh, rise of women in the workforce in particular. Mm. Uh, this seems to be associated with a shift to an informal uh, labour market and rising informality uh, and the, the bifurcation in the Japanese labour market between the old formal uh, uh, jobs for life and then the new, new economy. Uh, um, and a question, I guess another one is, is new technology somehow behind that? We've, we're seeing uh, a rise of new technology disintermediating firms, uh, making it easier for more marginalised workers to get into the labour market, making it easier for women uh, to match uh, what they sometimes consider to be their responsibilities in the home uh, with employment as well. So new technology may be part of this, uh, this structural adjustment. Uh, and the policy issue, I guess, is how, how should we respond? Should we be well, not we, should Japan be facilitating that? Uh, maybe applying some of the same kind of flexibility to the formal labour market, or uh, trying to provide some additional protections in the informal part. Um, now, the, the, the really uh, big issue that uh, has fascinated people uh, uh, for the last few years, um, monetary policy. Uh, and the real question, uh, why, is, uh, why is inflation so low, despite what is uh, in world terms almost unprecedented uh, uh, loosening through the QQE. Um, one reason potentially is that monetary policy has um, uh, avoided, the expansion in the, in the, in the uh, purchases by the Bank of Japan has avoided uh, debt denominated in foreign currencies. So they've been trying to avoid um, uh, any direct impact on the yen. Uh, in possibly to avoid um, uh, perceptions that they may be trying to manipulate the currency. But normally um, that, uh, that mechanism, that, that transmission mechanism through extraordinary monetary policy is one of the, is one of the key ones which uh, is used to drive um, uh, growth and inflation pressures in a country. We think about uh, the purchase of uh, the bonds, it is operating on the risk premium it is changing inflation expectations. And then the third sort of mechanism from, from those kind of uh, interventions is on the exchange rate. Uh, another one might, another reason why inflation might be too low, uh, according to the government's policy, um, is that even though the output gap is gone uh, by the numbers, um, that's an assessment of where we think the capacity of the Japanese economy is. New technology may be changing things in ways which are different going forward. So the supply that's a potential in the Japanese economy may be larger than we thought in the past. Normally, well, economists tend to think that the supply capacity in an economy, you, you see it when you see it. 
that's when inflation starts to take off. So in one sense, we haven't reached the output. This is a general view around many advanced countries. We haven't reached the point at which uh, output gap has disappeared because inflation hasn't taken off. Another one is that inflation expectations seem to be incredibly well anchored. Um, and uh, and uh, that has meant that um, it has been difficult, despite uh, uh, quite significant interventions, uh, to get inflation up. Now, uh, Ben Bernanke has suggested not long ago that what might be needed is a coordinated uh, fiscal and monetary expansion um, uh, to, 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 to get inflation up. And I have a personal view on that. It's outside my uh, both skill and... and, and, and um, and, uh, and understanding, but uh, one reason, there are two reasons I can see why governments might want to get inflation up in the current situation that Japan's in. One is that inflation actually acts a bit like a, uh, uh, it improves fiscal sustainability because it fundamentally improves the tax returns by, because most of the tax base is linked to nominal, nominal income. It also uh, reduces the real value of, of the existing stock of debt and it's hard to underestimate the size of that um, uh, impact. It is not trivial. So the existing stock of debt in real terms when you repay it is less if, you expect, if your inflation rate going forward is double, which is what the government's after. So it improves fiscal sustainability inflation. Another one that, um, uh, that uh, Ben Bernanke argues is that potentially the equilibrium interest rate in Japan consistent with full employment is negative, the real interest rate. And, with, and the only way to get a negative real interest rate when uh, you've got a zero lower bound is to have inflation. So you might need inflation to get closer to full employment. Um, on, I guess I should finish up uh, these sort of random thoughts. Um, one more observation on the supply side. As an economist, uh, supply side reforms are always good. Um, uh, it's, it's the, it's the long-run way of improving uh, well-being for the populations that we care about. Uh, one of the things I got from your slides, though, is this real question in my head. Does an ageing population um, make it easier or harder uh, to, politically to do reforms? In, in some of the traditional areas that people talk about in Japan's economy, which could uh, release resources to the other parts of it include the retail sector and agriculture. Um, uh, uh, would those, is reform going forward going to be easier with fewer workers in those, area, in those areas or uh, harder given their, 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 uh, their age? Um, I notice that older workers become less productive. I wonder which, whether they become more radical in their views about supply side uh, economic reform. Um, so, uh, with those sort of comments, um, I've got four, four sort of questions uh, for you, Yuri, if you, if you don't mind. You don't, the, the don't, don't have to answer to oh. your comments. Okay, so you already have made 10 comments. Oh, oh. So that <laughs> maybe, uh, no, no. Well, I that, feel like I'm, I'm taking an English examination. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. Because I'm finished out. Because, uh, yes. Yeah, it's already 10 or something. Oh, yeah. so right. maybe, I apologise. Uh, yeah. Just a comment. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Please, I think. Yeah. yeah. There's so many comments. Ooh. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. It's a very, very... <laughs> uh, otherwise, we're going to forget, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, yes, it's a very, very, uh, you know, suggestive uh, comment for Japanese economy, all, all the comments. And, uh, yeah, sustainability of the debt is a very, very uh, uh, severe issue for Japan. But uh, today, that, uh, you know, that... Uh, just, uh, uh, JJB has been financed by the 90% from the domestic market, and also the Bank of Japan, you know, just to uh, control the long-term uh, interest rate, and also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, these two points are very important to to be stable the interest rate. But I think that uh, you know, in the uh, era of the elderly people are going to increase. Uh, the saving rate of the uh, Japan is decreasing, and uh, I think the JGB uh, buyers are going to be more uh, from domestic to foreign countries. So it is very severe. Uh, it is a very 
uh, you know, more just a little bit uh, nervous uh, situation in the future. So Japan must to, to uh, you know, to struggle with the Jap uh, debt problem, fiscal debt problem uh, in the long term, I think. And uh, uh, about the labor force, uh, I think the new, new technology uh, is help, helping to the uh, women to attend the workforce, uh, as you said, I think. Uh, today, uh, in Japan, the tele work is a, just a bit, uh, is wider, in the, especially in the listed uh, companies or so. And uh, also, uh, the Abe administ ad administration says that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, as I said, that uh, has a, a, a woman uh, can uh, continue the works. Uh, and uh, the social help for the uh, child care or elderly nurse care is very important. So it, this is a core, one of the core of the new economics. So, and also the government has uh, set a goal to raise a proportion of women in leadership position uh, to about 30% by, 20, by 20, 20, 20, uh, 2020. Um, of course, uh, most companies are uh, unlikely to achieve to their goals, <coughs> but uh, the uh, labor shortage uh, is, uh, is uh, just to, uh, you know, encourage the women, uh, women to uh, enter the working market, and also the new technology support uh, mm. this uh, t tendency, I think. And so can I interrupt a little bit? Yeah. So that maybe there's so many questions now. Oh, you yes. need some time to think, so that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I may talk a little bit about uh, something nonsense. But uh, OK, I think uh, your point about the new technology and labor market is really interesting topic. Yeah. And it's really related to the you know, how the aging society is more, more promoting the reform so on. That's really interesting point. So that yeah. it depends on the technology. So that yes. because, you know, we really know, as you mentioned, that the working age population is shrinking. So the GDP is smaller. But it's not the end of the story because there are still many people. So we need to have maintained the consumption, you know, kind of the uh, level of the life standard. So that yeah, I think um, you know lots of people think you know all the people don't like the new technology, but uh, maybe in Japan, you know, because the new technology may help Japan. So yeah. maybe helping the the shortage of the you know maybe the prime age working people. So the and uh, especially I talk with Okina-san. So it's interesting thing is that I'm not quite sure whether fintech is really helping the older people, but uh, now Japan is uh, one of the the most uh, the least regulated <coughs> country in a fintech or something. You, you, or, uh, but uh, lots of new, you know, fintech firms are getting yeah, in, yes, so that yes, yes. people tend to maybe the I mean, Japanese government would like to follow what has been done in the past. But if it's really new, new technology, there's no history, so they may be able to accept rather easily. Especially that kind of technology can help the shortage of the uh, maybe the working age population or something. Do you, do you agree to that? Yes, kind of I view? think so. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there is some regulation for the. But uh, as for open API or something like that uh, to connect the uh, fintech companies to banks, it's a very, very early country, uh, country in the world to make uh, easier to, uh, to <coughs> connect each other by the open, uh, using the open API mm. technology. And also, uh, just we are preparing the sandbox uh, for the not only the fintech companies but also the uh, companies that do want to use the new technology, but the uh, uh, regulation is very grey. But uh, I think the Australia is, has already had the sandbox, regulatory sandbox, I think. Mm. And so, yes, Jap Japan is uh, very eager to uh, promote uh, digital innovation. Yeah, so that truly the existing uh, kind of the things like existing regulation, maybe Japan is really stubborn country and uh, yeah. rather rather hesitant to accept the new yeah. ideas. But uh, for new technology and especially the yeah. in facing this massive aging, you know, maybe you know Japan can be the country which accepts the new technology. And the Shiro would like to you you, you want to say something? Well, I have a question. When you have Okay, not yet, not yet. So there are so many questions. <laughs> not yet. Okay, so definitely I come back. And of course I come back to your questions. And, uh, and you have a 
four questions. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So then now the time to go for questions, or maybe uh, all right. So that maybe you you have. A, yeah, this is, let's, let's have a conversation, yeah, yeah. right. Do, do you want, so you want me, the, those four questions that... Uh, oh, so yeah, or, or, yeah, yeah, let's go to the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so th these are the completely unprompted ones. Um, so why don't wages increase in Japan? Hmm? Why don't wages increase in Japan? Ah, wages does not really increase because uh, so many part-timers are increasing in the, uh, in the labor market. So, uh, as you know that... Uh, uh, Japan has an uh, Japan Japan's uh, um, um, unemployment rate is very low, and uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, many elderly people and many uh, women are coming into the labor market, and also the foreign workers are just coming uh, these days. Very uh, large, large amount of. Uh, Labor, uh, uh, foreign laborers are coming in uh, in Vietnam and uh, from Vietnam or Nepal or Philippines and so on, and they are working as uh, taking working as a uh, uh, technical trainee, uh, tra technical intern trainee as the qualification, and also they are just a student to take a part time job, and uh, uh, the labor short uh, labor shortage is just a little bit. Uh, 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 I don't know, so tight, but uh, wage level is not so uh, high. And also, the, I think that uh, uh, many companies are very anxious about to raise the wages of the uh, regular workers because of the anxiety of the uh, future prospect of the, uh, uh, you know, the business environment. Yeah, maybe if you don't know much about the Japanese economy, think about the economy, you know, 2% unemployment rate. It's really low, you know, so if you want to get the job, 100 people would like to get the job, 1980 people can get the job. But the still wage is not increasing, so it's really puzzle. So the, but you think that, you said that, the, you know, because of the increase in a part-time or maybe increase in foreign workers, but uh, Will it continue forever, or you know, in the sometime in the future? Yeah. Do you think wage increase, or maybe we're gonna continue this yeah. kind of situation for foreseeable future? Yeah. I would like to know because uh, in, in, you know we can say in the end it's increased, but the, what we would like to when you know if it's a 20 years later or 30 years, it's not a, it doesn't make any sense. But yeah. do you do you have any any kind of estimate? I'm sorry, it's really difficult no. to tell, but uh, I, I want to have some clear figure yeah. about that kind of thing. I have not uh, ex uh, just uh, ex examined the when the wage yeah, increases, of course, yeah. but I think uh, uh, oh, oh, I think that uh, which uh, uh, participants rate of the uh, women are very, in, uh, very much increasing these days, and also the elderly people, are, uh, of course, uh, be, began to participate the uh, work in the labor market. But the volume is very not so much compared with the labor right. shortage. Right. So I think that wage uh, is uh, increasing in the future, maybe in. Five years or yeah. four and, uh, years or and something uh, that, like that. That's not necessarily mean a good news, you know. So the, you know yeah. because it, the people are not, um, wanted, wanted to have an increase in a wage, that's going to increase in the inflation rate. But the, yeah. that may increase the inflation higher, and the, maybe yeah. the you know the, the government debt the problem may be yeah. Yeah. larger. So the, yeah. I think in the future, you know, when wage really increases, should be a very important it's issue. Very and, um, important. We cannot take it as a good signal. Or, you yeah. Know, not, yeah. I think so. Yeah. So until at that time. Uh, we are struggling with that, uh, you know, supply side reform or fiscal reform. So, so, right. so, I mean, what, in the long run, wages are linked to labour productivity. Okay. But, but, but in, the, yeah. in, the, in the short run, and this is, it seems to be not only Japan, but other countries, advanced countries as well, where wages have been suppressed. And the good yeah. thing about being an economist is you can use the same framework in different countries and just tell, a, tell the same story but we in are, slightly different yeah. ways. We are just a full yeah. Yeah. There, there is something about the augmented labour supply curve here where we've thought the labour supply curve was in one position and it looks like, whether it's because workers are coming back into the labour force mm -hmm. from family life or old, older workers are working longer, mm -hmm. whether it's the supply of migrant workers 
whether it's something about technology helping workers sort yeah. themselves or do jobs, people with disabilities, et cetera, do jobs that wouldn't have been able to done before. Mm -hmm. The supply side of the economy seems more robust yeah. in advanced countries than we probably gave it credit for before yeah. uh, this happened. Yeah, and especially, so I'm, I'm, I, I interrupted too much, but uh, you know, transportation technology and information technology would be very interesting. What is the nightmare about the Japanese life is uh, commuting. You know, it's torture, you know, two hours <laughs> of the congested train. And so that if the thanks to the information technology or somehow the maybe, you know, right, maybe the not have to be a 1,000 kilogram car, but, you know, right car for one person or something, then, uh, you know, if we can commute much more nicely, then maybe we, we can, uh, you know, increase a little bit productivity or something. So that that's definitely related to the supply kind of thing. So that, yeah, yeah so that, again, it's uh, related to the new technology kind yeah. of thing. Oh, well, there's yeah. one more major effect, which is if, if workers are being shaken out of one part of the labour market and then they might move skill bias technology change, they might be moving down into the lower parts of the labour market to do jobs which they previously weren't trained for and again pushing down, mm -hmm. down, down wages in those parts. So the, the income distribution may be changing even though the employment may not be. Yeah, then uh, yeah. especially then uh, this is the something we discussed, somebody I forgot, but uh, maybe new technology, you know, gain from the new technology rather concentrating on a smaller number of the person, you know, maybe the average rate is going down. So only the one incredibly rich people and others are poor. So that, mm. yeah, that kind of issue must be also important for the wage dynamics in the long run. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You, any more questions? I've got one, one more. Yeah, please, please. please. Yeah. How are regional banks and others managing in a zero oh, interest yeah. rate environment? Yes, as uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there are many regional banks in Japan and uh, uh, as well as the three mega banks like Mitsui, Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, and Mizuho. And uh, these regional banks are not diversified like uh, mega banks, and uh, the weight of fee income is very small. So, therefore, if the zero interest rate continues and long run interest rate is zero, uh, uh, they cannot earn interest. So, as uh, Mr. Philip Lowe is a uh, uh, governor of the Australian Reserve Bank uh, says that uh, in July that an environment characterized uh, by low for long interest rate uh, may dampen the profitability of strength of financial firms and could change the firm's incentive to take risks, uh, which endanger additional financial sector vulnerabilities. Uh, this uh, perception is uh, uh, exactly the case in Japan, I think. So we must uh, monitor carefully to the financial market, I think. And especially the regional bank issue is related to the government debt problem. You know, there, there are investment opportunities, the government debt. So that it's true that a lot of people think you know, 90 percent of the JGB is held by Japanese. So it's just a dis distribution you know, program within Japan. But uh, you know, it's a significant portion of the JGB is held by the regional bank. So it may relate it to the financial crisis. So yeah. then, uh, you know, we know that everybody knows that the financial crisis can have a severe consequences. So, yeah, the, I think um, what's going to happen to the regional banking system? How can I'm not an expert on the banking system, but uh, yeah, that's also one of the big issues, how we can proceed with the reform yeah. in our regional banks. Because yeah. some, some countries have had negative interest rates yeah. uh, and have managed it OK. I'm just wondering why. Uh, why, why Japan? I mean, it's just a question of why Japan might be a bit more uh, sort of averse to it than others. I think that uh, uh, some uh, banks in uh, Denmark or Sweden uh, set uh, the in, uh, deposit interest rate for uh, large customers to negative, mm. so they can earn the interest. Mm. Uh, they, the banks themselves can earn interest. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Japan, it is very difficult to set the deposit rate negative. Yeah. So it is very, very uh, unpopular policies, right. uh, 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 strategy for banks. But, so, uh, but as you know, so that even we call it a negative interest policy, but it's not the real negative interest mm. policy because there's a convenience yield. So that if the, you know, the, if we, we make a deposit, but the interest rate is zero point one, do you want to get everything in a cash? No, it's okay to keep it. So mm -hmm. that that's a zero interest policy. So the I believe that by definition, it shouldn't have a huge impact on the macroeconomy uh, no. because why we can maintain that zero nominal interest because it doesn't change the behavior of the economic, economic agents. So that it's just a tiny thing. But uh, in Japan, as uh, Okina-san said, that the, somehow the banks cannot change the 
deposit rate negative, or you know, therefore the, it's just a shrinking in a margin. So that, that so therefore the you know, lots of banks are against about the negative interest rate policy. Yeah. So one more. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. one more, two more, three more. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, and this is a, 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 a political question. Uh, will the consumption tax be raised from eight to ten percent oh, in September two thousand and nineteen? I, I think that uh, uh, upcoming consumption tax will go up next year, next autumn, I think, as expected. Uh, as you know, that uh, uh, the current consumption tax is 8% in Japan, and uh, yeah, but it is planned to raise it to 10% next year. And uh, last time, uh, Abe-san uh, Abe uh, uh, raised the uh, uh, consumption tax from 5% to 8% in 2014. And uh, Abe-san was uh, criticized by the, from the low income sector people that uh, uh, it was very <laughs> huge impact for the, you know, the uh, 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 income. Uh, and as, at the same time, uh, uh, health uh, insurance premiums also raised at the same time, so uh, it, it was, um, uh, it is said that uh, uh, consumption in Japan is just a little bit uh, inf uh, affected by the uh, hike of the uh, consumption tax. Um, however, the, uh, this time the range of the increase is 2% from 8% to 10%, and, uh, uh, and uh, so we think that it will be possible to avoid a large consumption uh, deterioration, I think. Yeah, but I think you are the expert. So the, it, according to you, the, Gary is the, one of the you know, greatest macroeconomists. But the, he has done the research on the Japanese. How much the consumption tax to increase to sustain, to, to have? Like 30%. 30%, you know, so it's not just about 8% kind of thing. So but, uh, Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, let's come back to but, uh, Yeah, 10% yeah. is very insufficient. I That's think. right. But uh, still, we are struggling to raise yeah, that kind of yeah, thing. And I'll yeah. come back to the, that depressing 30% 30, 30 <laughs> number later. OK, so the, okay, of course, we, there are so many issues to discuss and uh, not that much clear solution. So the, you'd like to have some questions from the floor. It's a nice chance to have a, yeah. So the, This is an extension of a question answered by uh, Mr. McDonald, but towards, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce the names, Mrs. Um, Okinawa and um, Okinawa, Mr. not Okinawa, Okinawa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, Professor it. Fujiwara. Did I pronounce perfect, that right? Perfect, thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> um, in 2013, if you recall, the GDP, I mean, debt to GDP ratio for Greece was about 177%. Mm. The, GDP, the debt to GDP ratio in Japan in 2018 is around about 240%. In your opinions, what do you think is preventing a financial crisis from happening and a default on, no, not necessarily default on debt, but from the debt bubble bursting? Mm. I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the government said that uh, primary balance, uh, do you know that primary balance is uh, you know, just uh, expenditure and uh, just the expenditure and tax balance uh, is going to be balanced in 2025. And, uh, and, and, uh, and from that uh, uh, timing, uh, the uh, they, uh, the government said the uh, GDP uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio will just going to be uh, de decreasing. So uh, if the government uh, can do uh, uh, such a very uh, difficult task uh, to uh, Cut the, uh, cut the uh, expenditure and to increase the uh, tax and also to make the uh, growth strategy successful. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, it's a very narrow path, but uh, uh, maybe Japan can 
uh, survive with a very uh, huge debt, I think. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Can I join a little bit? Yeah. So that, yeah, what is the difficult thing in economics? It's always about the expectations. So that as long as, you know, you know, somehow the government do something in the future, if you believe that, that's yeah. totally okay. But uh, with, uh, <laughs> we can really believe, that's also an issue. And uh, also, the, um, you know, I think Okina-san implicitly showed in the figures, you know, that's a gross debt. You know, I said lots of JGBs are held by the governmental institutions. So that in net, it's like a hundred. Uh, yeah. 150 or, so. or 100 something. So that's, uh, it's going to be significantly lower. So that maybe still we can say it's, a, it's a marginally lower than the Greece things. And also that the difference between the Greece and Japan is that Japan is still the country with the highest net foreign asset. We are not the borrowing from the foreign country. You know, so that, yeah. of course, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's a really difficult question. But the, usually the crisis coming from the foreign investors. Foreign investors yeah. cannot believe the foreign country. Then uh, you know, they try to sell the debt or something like that. So the Japanese situation is just a little bit different. But um, I'm not told the answer to your question. But uh, maybe I totally agree to Okina-san. It's about expectation, yeah. about the future consolidation. So yeah. the credibility of the government is uh, Do most we important. Have it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. So we need to go back to Japan. So there, there, yes, there, 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 yeah. there is some math involved too. So, so it's uh, basic debt dynamics. Is, is the growth rate of the economy uh, going to be higher than the interest rate payments? When your interest payments start to get higher, that's when markets will realise that you're in a bit of trouble. And that's why those three things that I mentioned at the start are so important, because they're the things that keep uh, the interest rates low uh, relative to the, to the growth rate. And it is also why the supply side of the economy is fundamentally the answer to the, to the problem, because you've got to get growth up. And, and Greece was in, an, a, in Greece, Greece didn't have those characteristics I mentioned at the beginning. They had their debt denominated in a, in a, in a currency which wasn't their own, uh, for starters. Yeah, so sure. Thanks. So I, I just want to come in on a couple of those issues you left off on. I've enjoyed the conversation a lot, um, but about government credibility and reform credibility, because Okina-san showed quite nicely the three arrows um, in 2013, the three new arrows and in Society 5.0. Now, the first three arrows seem to make sense only if you undertake the third arrow um, structural reform, the supply side reforms which mm -hmm. you've been talking about. Now, I think the first arrow is quite easy. Just tell the Bank of Japan to you know, effectively print more money. Second arrow is easy. Government can spend mm -hmm. money. That's, that's fine and, and delay a consumption tax increase. But the third arrow is the key arrow to lift the potential uh, and the productivity and the potential of the economy. Instead of succeeding on that, and no, there was a little bit of progress, move to the three new arrows which seem like part of the third, part of the supply side reforms. Um, and they're important, but you sort of, you know, it's great PR for Abe marketing. It's been fantastic, you know, every few years roll out a new strategy. Um, but even on these, I think there's been pretty minor progress, pretty marginal progress. There's still shortage of child cares in some places, yes. which is unimaginable given you've got a shrinking cohort of of, of children um, and babies uh, and the social security reforms that were so important just haven't been undertaken. But it seems all the solutions now that are being talked about are technology related. Um, and some of the problems are going to be addressed by technology, but there are some pretty obvious big reforms that should be undertaken, surely, f and, and the government's sort of committed to. Now, the unemployment rate is 2%, it's very low, but that is people looking for jobs who can find jobs. There are pretty big distortions, um, tax distortions, and disincentives um, for spouses, and it's usually women, to work more than, what is it, about 13,000 Australian dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That seems like a ridiculous tax cliff that, that is keeping women out of the workforce when they want to work more. And that's, that's an obvious one. The childcare shortage is another obvious reform. Um, there seem to be some fairly obvious reforms that are holding the economy back. Given the, the big headwinds you, you're seeing um, with the demographic change, 
I guess my question is, is the government doing enough on these supply side reforms or are we just, just getting by, the debt continues to build, um, maybe you don't default on the debt but you get out of it with rapid, very, very high inflation eventually and very disruptive. I, I just can't see this sustaining, this situation sustaining without more reforms that actually take political, expend political capital. Yeah. Um. As for the regulatory reform, because I had been uh, working for the regulatory reform commission for many years, uh, in the, uh, the easing of regulation in the fields of such as agriculture or medicine, uh, init uh, initially made progression in the first, e first era of the administration, I think. And uh, such a, uh, maybe you are, uh, I think of the Japanese uh, uh, agricultural cooperatives, a very, very strong uh, uh, you know, political power in Japan. Uh, uh, but the uh, uh, Abe administration, uh, at the first time, tackled with uh, 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 agricultural cooperation and at that time, and uh, to pursue the reform in, in the agricultural fields. And uh, also, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, doctors' uh, association is very have a very big power, but uh, they are very corporate. Uh, they are <coughs> uh, in corporate co cooperation with Abe administration because uh, Abe administration have the political power uh, at the, the first time. So it depends. Uh, in the future, it depends on the power of the Abe administration, I think. So maybe I think the Abe, Abe san was the one of the uh, most uh, 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 um, so this name. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, prime ministers that struggled with reform in ten years or so, I think. But uh, it depends on the political position and political power, I think. So, <laughs> uh, is this a... Is, yeah, can I join a little bit? That's mm -hmm. a, it's a, I think it's related to, again, uh, Jason's the final point about the supply side reform and the aging society. So that, you know, thinking about aging society, and um, the, the, given the fact, you know, older people tend to go to the voting more than the younger people. Uh, they are more older people. and. Uh, if the older people are happy with the current regime, you know, then uh, you know, they don't have to think about the fiscal reform in the future, and uh, they want to have a right, they would like to maintain the right to go to the doctor anytime to meet their friends, you know. So then, uh, you know, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, just thinking about the po you know, poli political policy, you know, the, the politicians, you know, rational behavior, you know, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's not uh, rational, simply the rationality of them is uh, to, to win, okay. Then, uh, yeah, for that kind of things, you know, maybe that's uh, maybe the, the, the dark side of the Jason's comment. Maybe aging society may prevent the uh, reforms. But uh, quite new things, you know, maybe there's some new things, maybe we may adapt more. So that we are hoping some new technology, which we are not anticipating at the moment, will change the world or something. But you... So, so uh, I mean, as a policy economist who works for government, no government ever does enough economic reform. Um, uh, but I mean, sometimes we f don't give enough credit to just good, stable macro policy and um, and a market disposition in the government, uh, because market economies change and adapt regardless almost of what governments choose to do. Uh, so I, I suspect that Japan, like Australia and the United States, will have reform thrust upon it uh, through things like technological change, which can jump borders and jump regulation. Um, despite governments choosing not to reform or not. And uh, so, so uh, uh, the dynam dynam dynamism of the market economy can, can somehow sometimes uh, solve these problems when more coordinated actions by governments can't. But a good example would be the lift in the women's participation rate in Japan, which uh, seemed to be un unexpected to many. We've now got a higher participation rate in the United States and equal to Australia's, and I'm not sure that came from coordinated government policy, but just came because of the market wanting it. Mm. I think it is very lucky for Japan because the labor shortage is very severe. So the new technology is uh, very, very uh, uh, easy to introduce in the society, I think. Mm. 
It's a very not yeah. so. So in our maybe economics terminology, if the if the technology is a palette improving, you know, that mm. makes everybody happy, you know. So then uh, that kind of the kind of technology can be, you know, maybe surprise reform can be accepted rather easily. But uh, uh, maybe policy which may increase the majority of the welfare, but uh, somebody's got uh, miserable, then uh, that kind of policy may not be very easy to be accepted. I think so. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I just have um, two very quick questions for Mr. Yuri. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very comprehensive. Um, my first question was, I guess, um, we mentioned a uh, number of times there's a labor shortage in Japan. In the uh, near future, Japan will become a super-aged country. I'm just wondering, are there different uh, solutions? For example, we can see more, more, more women in the workplace or technology can take apart. Um, just wondering, would Japan consider uh, a policy open for migration from other countries? That's, that's the first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My second one would be, um, I, I think um, uh, Japan, Japanese people work really hard, and then uh, some people, they tend to work long hours. I'm just wondering, would those um, long extra hours the people work in Japan reflect in GDP, or is there any contribution uh, into the total uh, economy in Japan? So I think the first one is immigration. Could you let me know the second one? So it's a working long, and uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I think of I course think it's not so good working long. With, no, I mean uh, yeah, uh, yeah. a lot of um, a lot of Japan uh, these people they, they work long hours. Yeah, I have you know I have uh, come across different people or companies. Um, I'm just wondering those extra hours the people worked in Japan, mm -hmm. um, those extra you know effort mm -hmm. will be reflected in, into the uh, total GDP or you know, it will contribute to the total economy as a whole, um, you know, Japan economy. Okay, so that the second one is a bit the measurement issue, may not be very yeah. easy to understand. But, so, very uh, it's about, the, first about, one, but the first one is uh, how do you think, uh, I think about the immigration policy. And yeah, I okay? think uh, you, you would, would Japan yeah. um, uh, yes. consider that policy? Yeah, um, um, it is a very official position of the government, uh, the Japanese government, that uh, immigration, which means that by definition, uh, uh, increasing permanent uh, immigrant policy has not done in Japan. <laughs> but, however, uh, temporary foreign workers are increasing very much. Uh, currently, there are 1.2 million foreign workers and uh, 600,000 people and more has been increasing this five years. So in Japan, uh, as, you, as I said, that the unemployment rate is very low and uh, the productive age population is drastically decreasing. So uh, uh, especially remarkable labor shortage can be found in elderly nursing care and uh, retail manufacturing and agriculture and so on. Maybe <laughs> almost all the uh, industries, but especially in these fields are very much, uh, have the very much shortage. So, uh, as I said that uh, many of the acceptance of present simple labor uh, qualification of uh, trainee, uh, uh, technical intern trainees and uh, uh, with learning skills in Japan and making it useful by returning home country, and not uh, just for the labor shortage, but uh, to make the you know the uh, cooperation with the international and uh, 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 international cooperation, um, and also besides that, there are quite a lot of people who can work as foreign students and work part time. So together, these two journals, it reaches about 500,000 people. So uh, at, at this situation, uh, the Abe administration said in this June that uh, the, uh, the labor shortage cannot be resolved. So the, the, uh, the government decided to establish new qualification uh, uh, and uh, the study is currently underway. <laughs> and uh, the extension of workable period 
uh, from five years to 10 years, or increase of the industries that can employ foreign work workers is being studied. But the uh, government said that uh, uh, they do not uh, uh, change the so-called immigration policy it is not uh, the solution, just uh, to uh, accept uh, foreign workers more. But uh, there are so many discussions now, and uh, maybe in autumn, uh, uh, there are uh, some, some discussions in diet, I think. So regarding your second question, so your question reminds me of the very famous book in the 1990s. So there's a book by the World Bank called The East Asian Miracle. And uh, lots of people thought that there's a miracle kind of things happening in East Asia. But uh, some macroeconomists pointed out it's just uh, due to the longer working hours. OK, so the, therefore, the, of course, the, you know, if you believe in a simple model, you know, lo longer working hours increase the GDP. You know, but, uh, but it's a problem at the moment is that uh, just working is not enough. You know, because in a catching up economy, when, where the, you know what to do, you just follow what the falling for frontier countries are doing. You know, working long hours may increase your efficiency. But now what is needed is a more creativity, creating something new. So that it's a conceptual issue. So that, uh, maybe the working too many hours may reduce your credibility, uh, productivity. Then, uh, it may have a negative impact to the output. But uh, simply, if you believe in a constant productivity, then an increase in working hours should increase in a GDP. And that should have contributed to the high GDP in Japan in the past, for sure. Right. Can, can, yeah, if, please. Uh, yeah, so, so GDP doesn't include an adjustment for the hours worked. It's just the market value of all um, uh, output in the economy, the market value of the output. Measures of labor productivity conceptually should adjust for it, because that's the amount of inputs that go into producing it. But all of the measures you ever use, you need to look at carefully because the shift from women participation into the workforce, they'll be moving out of unmeasured home production into market production, which will be boosting GDP as well. So, so the, the, whenever you're looking at your numbers, you need to think about what's actually going on and what exactly they are measuring. Yeah, and also I can add one more important thing. So that there's a concept called home production. Mm -hmm. So in Japan, you know, Lots of housewives are, you know, d preparing for the dinner. So that, you know, that's definitely increasing your utility. So, for example, if you want, if you want to increase the GDP in Japan, ask your wife to work for the neighbors and get the money. I think then, uh, you know, we can increase the uh, GDP, but it doesn't change the welfare. I think uh, there's so many kind of things maybe yeah. related to the working hours. Yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. So the get you doing about? Yeah. Yeah. No, I was, I was going to actually ask the question about the uh, about the debt, but uh, the kinds of things I would have said were, were said. But I'm still, I'm. I, let's go a little further on this expectation uh, idea. So here's the situation. You know, Japan uh, has a debt to output ratio, debt to GDP ratio that's extremely high, and they're selling JGBs at a very low discount, which would seem to imply people don't expect. There to be default, they don't expect high inflation and have that uh, disappearing. You, see, you know, you're talking about the regional banks are are holding these things in, in large numbers. You know, presumably, in counterpart to deposits from you know their liabilities and and you know, so why are these regarded as so safe? I mean, the idea that Japan could have a growth <laughs> miracle is a is a very you know uh, certainly not a certain event. And uh, so why does it sell at such a low discount? And and you know we're asking about Greece. Well, Greek debt was held by Germans. Japanese debt is held by Japanese. So it must be hedging. Uh, so the alternative is you have those two big. Um, Parts of the budget, you know, the the servicing of the of the debt and the social security. One of those are the two big things. Is so one of those has to go? Well, if one goes, I mean, maybe these are, you know, that. Uh, so I have savings in the form of JGBs. If those are safe, then they they reduce uh, they they raise my taxes and they reduce my uh, social security uh, and health care benefits when I get old. I'm I'm good. If the uh, JGBs default, well, then I have, uh, then they're going to they're going to give me my uh, Social Security. Do you think? Is there any evidence? I don't know enough about Japan. Is there is there any evidence that that may be how people are thinking? I guess is my question. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you're buying, 
if uh, if your debt is denominated in your own currency and your future retirement is on goods which are also going to be in that currency, then maybe if there is a bit of inflation, you still get an, the nominal value back even though the real value may have fallen. That might give you confidence to go and buy it, you, you, particularly relative to other things you can invest in. If you want to invest in US bonds, you've got the exchange rate risk that you might be worried about. So the domestic, sa it's kind of rational in one sense for the domestic savers to, despite all the returns that are high everywhere else in the world, to go and buy those bonds, knowing that at some point in the future they want to get that yen back and to buy domestic goods and services in retirement. And if the nominal value is the same, great. But if the, and if the real value's fallen, so I think it's quite, it's kind of rational at, at, at that level, which is Yuri's point. When savers start to get old and there's not as many of them and they're running down their savings, then the marginal investor becomes the foreigner. That's when the issue yeah, mm -hmm. probably presents yeah. itself. And uh, can I add that? Maybe add that because you are the general equivalent macroeconomist, but yeah. a little bit partial, <laughs> partial explanation. So why the, still the people investing in a JGB, yeah. you know? I think uh, thinking about the uh, three recession after 1990s, it's always coming with yen's appreciation. So somehow the, you know, Japan has the biggest country with the biggest net foreign assets. So when the global economy is in a recession, Japanese yen tend to appreciate. So that, yeah, the, the foreign investment is a really, really risky investment. You know, yen return becomes really low in a recession. So that. Somehow we knew that kind of thing from the three experiences, and you know, even the bust of the bubble, you know, yen appreciated. Even the, after the great earthquake, yen appreciated. It's really crazy, you know, because uh, <laughs> earthquakes happened in Japan. That's a risk to the global economy, so yen appreciated. So that somehow the it's it, it's a bit irony, but uh, you know, of course, thinking about the shrinking of population, we should do efficient foreign investment. That is necessary, but. Uh, Thinking about the risk and the return, so the foreign, foreign investment is, can, tend to be a really risky investment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, maybe, uh, maybe Oki first, yeah. So, I'm Tatsuyoshi Okimoto from ANU. So I'd like to come back to the consumption tax hike. So I was, I was very glad to hear, you know, Okina-san is not worried about too much. Uh, I still have small concern. Mm -hmm. But you are not living in Japan anymore. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that, right. that, that's my point. You yeah. know. So, <laughs> so I moved to, from Japan to Australia in 2014. So I've never experienced inflation in Japan. Mm. And I did experience inflation here. Mm. And I don't like it. I hate it. <laughs> So, so we, we, you don't like inflation? Or? Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, I do believe, you know, for many, you know, young people in Japan never experienced mm. inflation. Yeah. And, you know, consumption tax hike is the only occasion they experience inflation. Yeah. So I, I'm expecting they really hate it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's uh, the one of the reasons I have uh, some concern. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, you know, investment related to the Olympic Games will be disappearing. Mm, yeah, yes. So that's brought me another concern. Yeah, yeah. So, so my question is, what's the quickest things or quickest policy the government do for the next couple of years? Oh, yes, I see. Uh, so the, for the tax consumption tax and Olympic things, I yeah. see. I think that uh, uh, inflation, I don't like inflation too, but uh, 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 I think inflation. I think these two, 20 or 30 years, almost all the world economy has not experienced uh, not so huge in uh, advanced in advanced countries not experienced huge uh, inflation, but uh, uh, experience a very large financial crisis. So uh, maybe the people's welfare was very, uh, you know. Uh, 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 Against the against yeah. by the, that kind of financial crisis, so we just forget the, how the harmful the inflation is in Japan. I think, and I think that the uh, government will uh, uh, doing some uh, uh, stimulus by the uh, uh, financial uh, expenditure. I think at, at the timing of the. Uh, 
raise of the uh, consumption tax, I think. But uh, I think uh, it is inevitable, um, but I, I, I hope that this expenditure will uh, use the very appropriate uses for to the Japanese uh, you know, uh, growth, I think. And after Olympic Games, it, uh, it is a uh, very, uh, there are not so many events in Japan. Maybe uh, Tokyo, uh, Olymp uh, Osaka. Don't forget the rugby. Uh, yeah, yes. This is Australia, <laughs> so that there's a rugby World Cup next year. Uh, yes, yes. That's what you said. But yeah. uh, there, <laughs> yes, there is not so many events. And, but and, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, digital innovation is one of the uh, important issue that the Japanese companies and Japanese society will uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, use and uh, to improve the productivity of the uh, Japanese camp and uh, Japanese economy. I think. So, so uh, I, I don't. I'm probably uh, a bit different in the sense that uh, I don't mind a bit of inflation. And in, in the normal New Keynesian kinds of models where there's downward nominal wage mm -hmm. rigidity, a little bit of inflation helps structural yeah, yes. adjustment because real wages can be reduced without anyone doing anything in those parts of the economy that need to shrink. And nominal wage gains can be higher in those parts of the economy and therefore real wage gains can be higher in those parts of the economy where you do want more productive workers. So a little bit of inflation helps that structural adjustment yeah. process without politicians having to close down certain industries and open up other ones. Uh, so that's one you know, positive about it. Yeah. The other one is uh, the, the increase in the, in the GST will, in present value terms, um, fundamentally improve the fiscal position of, of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of Japan. Uh, and a 2%, a one-off increase in the price level of 2%. Uh, we roughly did that in Australia when we introduced our GST in 2000 and we sailed through it without an issue. Um, uh, but it does reduce the real value of the outstanding debt. The last thing I'll say is these questions about when to change major changes to the tax system are differently answered for macro positions depending on your macro position. And Japan is closer to full employment uh, and so the kind of what's the impact on expectations might be different to what it was in the previous increase, which many economists mm -hmm. think was a bit of a problem. Okay, so that we have about one one question. Do you have any more? So we would like to have one more question or something. Okay, so the, this is a final question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm on it. Um, I'm Joel Rathus from the Treasury. Thank you very much for the panel. Um, I have a question about fiscal and monetary policy. It's actually two questions, but they're very similar. Um, as, so we've talked about Australia, uh, Japan's consumption tax being scheduled to increase from 8 to 10% next year. Mm -hmm. um, and let's assume that that's what happens, that it doesn't get postponed, which has happened in the past. Um, and you mentioned before Japan's fiscal strategy of getting to a primary balance. Mm -hmm. It's balanced by 2025. Mm -hmm. So there's an, uh, an imperative to, to raise this tax or a tax. Um, so uh, Yuri, uh, or... Okina-san, uh, imagine you're the, the governor of the Bank of Japan and you've had to already sort of let the, the rate around the 10-year bond, the range move from 0.1% to 0.2%, so sort of maybe allowing a little bit mm. higher because there's pressure in your financial system, yeah. these regional banks we talked about, and also you can look at the United States and you can see their trajectory. All right, so you can see maybe you've got a bit of tightening that you've maybe tried to do there. Um, and at the same time, next year, you're seeing a negative fiscal impulse. As an economist, um, what is it that you're going to do? Do you want to keep that path of normalization or sort of slow mm -hmm. normalization that's outlined in the, you know, the Bank of Japan's current statement on monetary policy? Um, how would you approach managing that negative fiscal impulse? And two, this is the second but related question, imagine that Specifically, you're um, Haruhiku Kuroda, and you've been reconfirmed. Prime Minister Abe is still the Prime Minister. You've known this man for 10 years, a long time of working relationship. Um, in that circumstance, uh, what would you do? Would you think about doing anything differently because you might be able to leverage that relationship, have a closer coordination between fiscal and monetary policy than might be possible in other parts of the world? 
and if you have the time, a comment on growth, mm -hmm. impacts on growth. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, it is a, a very good uh, question. Thank you so much. Um, I think that uh, uh, the inflation rate will not so uh, reach uh, to reach two uh, percent. Maybe not not in a few years. I think maybe next, uh, it takes. Uh, uh, I don't know <laughs> exactly, but it takes uh, four years, four or five years, I think. So maybe um, I think uh, it is uh, a very, very slow speed uh, to uh, to pick up the uh, long-term interest rate to the normal position. I think so. In uh, it is a, a very important period for Japan in that period that the uh, structural reform must, do, must be done and also the fiscal deficit uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cut or something uh, like that is very important to be done in that period, I think. So um, maybe these four or five years is very, very important uh, when the, uh, 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 when the Bank of Japan can control the long-term long interest rate a little bit later as uh, compared with the normal level, I think. And the, as for the second point, Abe-san and Kuro-san is a very good relationship. And uh, Abe-san is, uh, uh, is uh, maybe, I think, uh, have a very uh, good confidence with Kuro-san's uh, monetary policy. But uh, Kuroda-san is, uh, uh, from the viewpoint of Kuroda-san, I think uh, he is very anxious about uh, the speed of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, fiscal re reconstruction and also the structural reconstruction. So I think the Kuroda-san is uh, uh, just a little bit uh, uh, very in uh, severe position compared with the uh, first uh, Abe administration, I think. Okay, so time is up, and I uh, thank you very much for your active participation. Uh, please join me thanking uh, Yuli and Jason for fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.